I'll be completely honest, when we started SFQP, um, none of us knew how to write a grant, didn't really know what a grant was, didn't know the whole like, nonprofit application process, what that was like. So a lot of our first years as an organization, as a collective, was really grassroots. We fundraised uh, for our first three Pride Festivals based off of backyard house parties, selling jello shots at bars, uh, talking to people just based on a dream and not knowing where to really go from there. And through this whole process, um, I have become a grant writer. I have become, you know, somebody who can easily file for like a nonprofit status and whatnot. But I find the resources that really generate the most uh, wealth and the most connection in the work is really just human interaction and empathy. I think that for a lot of what we do, working with like vulnerable, marginalized communities, talking to people face to face who maybe never saw the reason why your organization or why SFQP exists is the biggest thing. I mean, of course, you know, resources like financial ones and kind of a uh, more physical assets, especially for marginalized people within our community are important, but I think that human compassion and understanding and, and just wanting to be engaged once you are engaged with that compassion is like the biggest resource that anybody could, could really ask for, so. The people from Bank of America. We use our um, events where we put hygiene kits together to invite other corporate sponsors, and then I would just kind of do a side conversation um, to find out where people work, what they did, and how could we um, use their services. Um, and so that's how we have been successful. Um, I, myself now, am getting into a little bit more grant writing, uh, but we have just been blessed to be able to be seen as being transparent and showing people uh, with the in-kind donations that were donated to us where they were going as well. And so I think that's very important that people actually see where their money is being spent. Um, so I'm always on social media trying to show that. Um, the challenges we had were the no's, um, but I also use the challenges as the building blocks to the yes. Um, so if I had $100 million, what would I do with it? So I'm already prepared to tell you what I would do with it. Um, <laughs> but what can we do with $20,000? Let me show you what I can do with that. Um, and I think that's important, especially when you're starting out small, um, because a lot of times I think we see the larger organizations who are doing we may think that they're doing all of these things um, based on uh, the funding that they have. And um, so a lot of those programs that are already set forth are sometimes already paid for. So we're always looking to uh, try to get ahead of that before we get there, if that makes sense. Basically, I'm always thinking about the next event we're going to do. How is that going to be funded? Who's going to, to be our sponsor? Um, and we're, we're still not there. And I, myself, still find challenges being a black gay female in the rooms where this type of work is pretty much led by men. Um, and so I'm still trying to find that voice, but I think for me just doing the work is more important than trying to figure out the other components of finances. Community members engaging and making a difference. How can, can, how can all of these three stakeholders engage with nonprofits to make a meaningful difference? Um, and, and can you give us an example? Like all three of you are in very different parts of Georgia. So it's going to look very different in different places. And you know, maybe someone out there is, is, is tuning in and they're going, you know, I really want to engage, but I can't donate. Or I want to engage, but I can't come and, and volunteer. So, so creatively, how could people engage from a a big corporate level to a smaller community level. Um, Erica, I'm going to throw that one out with you and start with you on that one. Uh, let me see. So the pandemic really taught us a lot. I tell people, if you didn't learn anything from the pandemic, shame on you. Um, I actually had to do a lot of work at home myself. Um, but I also think it gave an opportunity for the conversation to be had. So when you say, how can other people engage, maybe they can't do the physical, but they can make a phone call. They can say, hey, there's a young lady who's driving a van around feeding people. Um, you know, uh, you may be, have an introduction to a corporation who has hygiene problems or have the finances to help us do the work that we would like to do. Um, I do miss, I did, we're back now, but the Out Georgia Business um, lunches, 
were something that I was able to go to. I think as the pandemic hit, we learned to use social media and the virtual world to be able to do a lot of things on that platform. So I think now the new normal is a part of that conversation. So how can we have, you know, you can now do a fundraiser online. Um, you can utilize that conversation to stretch across the table to whatever your field is. And although we are not in the city of Atlanta right now where we would like to be because we don't have a brick and mortar, once we do that, that will open up more opportunities. So we always have to be creative to how to get people more involved. And it is a stretch sometimes. It's difficult because a lot of people like to actually come out to be more hands-on. But I think just keeping the conversation moving in that direction until we can get back to that sense of normalcy will just keep people kind of innovating on new ideas how to be a part. Description, the exact square footage, the exact layout that we wrote in the business plan. And we were like, how awesome is this that we needed those five years to pass for our vision to mature within us. We weren't ready to be in the position we were to have 40, 50 employees right out the rip. If we didn't know ourselves enough to know the leaders that we would become. And so it was all in divine timing. And, and once, Another story, so I was, I was producing events for automotive companies, and I was like, this is my last tour. I've been on the road for 16 weeks, and I'm missing my family. I come home and I feel like a stranger because we live somewhere else and the furniture's rearranged and all of this. And I said, this is my last tour, and this was in December. And we found the spot, or we started, uh, building out in February. Hey, you've spoken into existence. Wow. And that's all it took was, was to say it out loud, to make set that intention, and the rest just happened. There it is. Yeah. Yep. And for me, it's scary money don't make no money, right? Because at the end of the day, um, as you scale, you can think about what your business was gonna be, what you, what you imagined it to be. Um, you always have to keep learning no matter what level you're gonna be at. Yep. Um, I say all the time, I still walk into our office and be like, oh wow, like, <laughs> You know, we, we, this is real. So it still feels like, you know, it feels that way. But I remember, right? I remember, you know, in year two when I'm like, why are we not getting these million dollar contracts? Like, we it, what's up? What are they doing? You know, yeah. come on, come on, come on, right? And so now it's like, you ready. Now you're ready. And, you're... and, and so um, you have to understand the lesson and, and just, you know, uh, the universe's timing. Um, yes. <laughs> However. Oh. You know, it's, it's an interesting question and it, it makes me emotional because it's a uh, it can be sad um, not e not even professionally leaving people behind but people who are in your personal lives friends uh, associates family whose mindset is not expansive enough to understand where you're going uh, or some people who may think you are doing better than you actually are, oh, and who always has a comment, or a this, or a that, or a that. That energy has to be left behind, otherwise you will not uh, see your truest potential. Uh, and like I say, it's sad because these are people who you may have grown up with, known for years, but if they don't have the vision, they say, you know, they say, as you go to the top of the mountain, there's less and less space. That is just so true. Um, what I like to do is say, though, it's not that you're not coming along with me, it's just our relationship is paused there. So if I see you again, we'll pick back up from there. It's just not going to grow any more than where it is because we no longer serve the same purpose in each other's Amen. lives. Amen. And, and that's a hard pill to swallow, but once you realize that your growth is being stunted, you have to take a look as to why. Am I always hanging out with this person and not paying attention to my business? Do they really have my best interest? Are they talking shit behind my back and it's coming to me? And then all of that negative energy, all of that, you just don't need it, so. Oh. Can I tell a, a, a story about a conversation you had with a friend 
where you had to do this, it changed my life. So as we were growing, and or he was growing, my husband, there was a friend who the, the relationship was just stagnant, done, over. And G said something on the phone that was so mind-blowing. He said, I don't like who I am when I'm around you. And so, I have, to make a different, <laughs> I have to make a different choice. And it has nothing to do with you. It's about me and my growth and my development and what I see for my life. And it was emotionless, which meant it was just truth. And I'm sitting on the phone like, let me examine how I show up around people and see if I like this person or not. It really had me, you know, taking inventory, taking stock in myself and how I show up in different spaces. That conversation, and I wasn't even a part of the conversation, I was just listening. It changed my life. Awesome, great words. Dr. Elijah. Oh. <laughs> right. So, uh, that, I love that question because it's so um, personal for me. So, something that came to me is that everybody everybody in this room is a part of the process but not everybody is a part of the promise some people are a part of the process but not everybody is a part of I enjoy that the yeah. promise <laughs> right and so for me to answer your question I lost it all in 2017 I was uh, affirmed as an apostle I'm a former pastor and when the apostle was praying on my head, I don't even know what was going on in the room. She said, uh, God said, it is finished. And I didn't, I was like, what's finished? Did anybody else hear that? I'm, anybody hear that? And within six months, I understood that. Within six months, our ministries were closed. I was separated from my now former wife and I had started my transition and I had $200 in the bank. I'm talking about 200, like retirement was gone, entrepreneurship, you talk about credit cards, I'm talking about $200 in the bank. So to answer your question, I lost it all. And that was a time for me to know who was supposed to be a part of the promise. Mm. Because many people then left because they didn't see the vision, right? And now, some of those people are coming back, but now I've got a whole new vision, so they don't understand that vision, right? So, you know, some people will, will be our, a part of the process and thank them, and it, hopefully it was a reciprocal friendship, relationship, business -ship, and there's no love loss. For me, there's never any love loss because it's not, it's not personal, it's always a business. Hopefully I've added value to you somehow and, and, and vice versa. But let me tell you, it's painful. That stuff hurt. Yeah, sometimes you can renegotiate those relationships and, and meet each other years down the road as new people, you know? But not everybody's capable of that. Yeah, I don't think I have that gene. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, God's still working on me. But I agree. I, I agree, and I, I can understand the, the thought process behind it. <laughs> See, that in practice for me, it would probably be very difficult. But I'm a Sagittarius, so. Uh, what does that mean? You know, we, we, you know. I get you. We're, we're done. <laughs> Thank you. When we're done, we're done. Um, so, one more question from our audience. Anybody? Oh, okay. yes. Let's give it up for Chris Luga. <laughs> Go Gators. Hey. Um, I have a question. When, when you're thinking about what's next for Authentique, for Virgil's and the, the restaurants and the businesses, and Dr. Elijah Nicholas, what, what is inspiring you right now? What is maybe helping you think about future plans uh, and trajectory from here? Um, I'll say for me, my team inspires me because we've already reached where I, where I thought we were gonna go. Like, I'm like, hey, we're here, okay, cool. So I'm, I'm really now at a place of, well, what y'all wanna do? What kind of business do you want us to work on? Oh, oh you wanna do fashion? Oh, you wanna do healthcare? Oh, you wanna do cannabis? You wanna do these things? Okay, let's figure that out. So I'm more so now 
um, listening to them to hear my trusted advisors, because I couldn't do anything I do without them. So, um, yeah, for me, and, and then I'm also looking at, you know, retiring, like, and saying, hey, let me pass the baton to someone else that is ready to take on this role, because as Dr. Elijah mentioned, like, it's hard. Like, it's, you know, when you're a founder, you have founder syndrome, then you have to run the business, then if you have to actually be in the work, and then when you try to get somebody else to, it's a lot, right? But, but at the end of the day, when it clicks and it works, um, you know you're on the right path. Yeah, absolutely. What, what's driving me is liberation and freedom, uh, which is, you would think that it's, it should be the other way around. Like, the, the longer we're in this business, the more freedom we're experiencing. Uh, and I think that's all about the trusting of self, trusting the vision, trusting the plan, and executing the plan, and then building that solid team. But as we're growing the Virgil's brand, uh, the bigger we get, the freer we become. And that's exciting. At first it was confusing because I had to reprogram myself uh, from the nine to five mentality, always have to be doing something, always have to be working, always have to be on a call, always have to be responding to an email, always have, uh, and when you look at me like, well, I don't have shit to do. And that's okay. Yes. That's okay, you know, and sit there and reside there for a moment. So I'm looking forward to not necessarily retiring, but not having shit to do. <laughs> I know that's great. <laughs> well, uh, said, nothing, nothing to do. And to, to stop judging myself for it, yeah. you know? Yes. Stop Amen. judging Amen. myself. All those voices you hear in your Come head, they now. may sound like somebody she else, but that's you. your voice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay. Ain't nobody thinking about you. Right. You know, except you. So. <laughs> yes, I love that. So for me, um, this is what inspires me. Madoodle, my children's book. Uh, Madison is my love superhero. And I'm inspired by TikTok and the messages I get from parents. You know, I got a message a couple of weeks ago from a mom who's an ally, and she ordered my doodle, and uh, I get a little emotional because she sent me an email after, uh, well, before she ordered it, she said, hey, I'm a TikTok fan. I, 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 don't, I don't consider myself like a celebrity on TikTok. Like, but, but what's your TikTok at? Right, I'm like, I gotta Dr. look Elijah, around. Dr. Elijah's <laughs> 22. <laughs> um, and so I sent her the book, and fast forward, she got the book, and then she read the book, and, and one of the things she said before she even read, received the book, she said, thank you, because I'm gonna share this book with my seven-year-old, and read this with my seven-year-old. And my hope is that my seven-year-old will share the book and have conversations with other littles. She called the kids littles. <laughs> and that just warmed my heart. And after she got the book, she sent me a message and she said she was in tears from the book and the experience with her daughter. And so that gives me hope that an ally, someone who's, who's observing, if you will, and helping the community find some love from a little African-American girl named Madoodle, who's just navigating the journey of her Uncle Pete, who used to be her Auntie Mary. Like, that's why I wake up every day. Awesome, let's give it up for our panel. Thank you so much. Get on down. Get on down.